As you set out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Cyclops and angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You'll never find things like that on your way as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Hope your road is a long one. May there be many summer mornings when, with pleasure, what joy, you enter harbors you're seeing for the first time. Keep Ithaca always in your mind. Arriving there is what you're destined for. But don't hurry, the journey at all. Better if it takes for years, so you're old by the time you reach the island, wealthy with all you've gained on the way, and not expecting Ithaca to make you rich. Ithaca gave you the marvelous journey. Without her, you wouldn't have set out. She has nothing left to give you now. And if you find her poor, Ithaca won't have fooled you. Wise as you will have become, so full of experience, you will have understood by then what these Ithacas mean. Three minutes to watch. <laughs> You're right about five minutes. Camera graba. El sonido. Two minutes to go. <laughs> well, Bren, I think I'm going to hit you with a big question. That's the first question. Well. I know it's a difficult one to respond to because it's, it's, I guess it's kind of vague. But uh, I really like to hear it from you because I'm sure you've had a lot of time to think about this. So uh, who is Brendan Grimshaw? Uh, other people would put it more simply. They would say I was a rebel. Uh, I, I don't agree I'm a rebel at all. Uh, I, I, I think I just followed, followed my, what my mind told me. For, all right, follow my instinct here. We go back to the instinct again. But I, I just did what I, I wanted to do. I consider myself very ordinary. I was just a, just a boy. And at 15, I'd had enough. I didn't want any more school. I, was not interested in uh, mathematics. I was not interested in mechanics. I wasn't very interested in physics. But I was very interested in writing. But my mother was quite very intelligent. And uh, she knew that the headmaster of the school, his son, worked on a local newspaper. So she was the one who got me an interview with the editor of the paper. And the editor asked me, did I want to be a reporter or a newspaper man? And I remember not waffling, I said, well, what was the difference? And he looked at the kid, I suppose, and he said, well, a reporter knows how to report, a newspaper man knows all about newspapers. Well, I wasn't all that grim. I said, oh, I want to know all about newspapers. And he said, you start tomorrow. Brendan was 15 when he quit school. 
he would go on to become the youngest newspaper editor in England. But Brendan had other dreams, and he followed his heart into Africa. He would establish himself as editor to newspapers in both Kenya and Tanzania. I did well in, in my job, um, and uh, I became editor of the two main newspapers in, in, in the country. I was friend of everybody from not only to the office boy but to the president, and I had access to everybody. Um, there was an ele element not only of doing a job that I liked to do, but of course there was an element of well, the job being something that was useful, uh, and useful with a sense of power. Um, I, I don't mean sort of power to hammer and tell people to do this and do that. I, I mean power in the way that you could actually really do good. You could see things going wrong, and you could, as a person, put them right. But Africa was changing and a growing resentment against colonial occupation was slowly becoming organized as ideas of freedom and stories of successful rebellion abroad spread to people surrounded by poverty and white dominion. I know Brennan to be beyond politics. He sees people as equals and could not help but sympathize with the desire of freedom that surrounded him. I had a, a very good friend, for example, uh, he was called Eduardo Mondlan. He would have made a very good president of Mozambique. Uh, he loved books, and uh, he uh, had a little house, a little cottage on the beach in Tanzania. And uh, in between going into Mozambique, he was a freedom fighter or a terrorist, whichever way you want to look at it these days. Uh, he. Um, he, he used to have lots of books sent to him. And uh, one day, this man who I used to swim with and joke with, say I was a Portuguese submarine and bang, bang, and when we were swimming off, off, uh, off the coast in, in, uh, in Tanzania, uh, he opened his, and he was blown to pieces. And I went to his funeral and, but uh, I say, yes, it's a cruel world. I mean, he was a good man. He, he, his, I, I know his whole thinking, his whole, whole idea was to do good for his people, to do good for Mozambique. And I'm, I'm sure he would have made a very, very, very good president. But uh, somebody decided otherwise. These were very difficult times for anyone with human concerns and Brendan understood his time in Africa was coming to an end. This is the man he would hand over his job to. But luckily for him, a new dream would begin to take shape. And two of my friends had married Seishawa. They told me how beautiful the islands were. And so I caught a boat from Mombasa, and I came to Seychelles. But uh, after I'd been in the islands for about a week, I suddenly realized that this is what I wanted. That I wanted, I wanted a place in the, in the Seychelles. I took, spent three weeks looking, and I didn't find anything. Came the end of my holiday, the last day, I went to visit a lawyer in his office. Living, his office was a, oh, very dry, barren sort of office. It stacked with <laughs> tin boxes of deeds, with, all with pink ribbons on them, I remember. 
And uh, he was a very nice guy, he called Raoul, and uh, we're sitting talking, and his telephone rang. Now, I tell, I tell youngsters, it always pays to be polite, because if I hadn't been polite on this particular day, I wouldn't be sitting on the island as I am now. I got up and went to look out of the window, so I was away from the telephone conversation, and I looked down into the street, and along was coming a guy, 18-year-old guy, and he looked up and said, hey, you want to buy an island? But anyway, uh, he came up. The boy said to me, I'll, I've got a boat. Would you like me to take you over? And I said, yes, very much. So we came across, and I always remember, coming across the, the bay, there are some rocks just off Round Island, and they, they look very dangerous. <laughs> and uh, this boy was fast speedboat went zoom straight through and I sort of held as a yik. And that he, he, got, he got me to Moyen quite safely and I stepped ashore for the first time. And uh, it was totally different. It was a, a special, special feeling. This was a, a feeling that, oh yes, this is what I want. This is the, this is the place, that, this is the place that I I really feel or felt that I, and what I've been looking for. And uh, I came up onto the plateau here where the house is, and there was an old, old broken, anteaten building which I suppose had been used for picnics. Uh, no one had lived on the island since 1915, a long, long time. And that was Miss Bess. Well, it all came crashing down around my ears because when we found the man who owned the island, he said, oh, I don't want to sell. I don't want to sell. And you know, you can, can, when you've built yourself up, you've, got, you've found something, you know what you want, this is it. What happens when the ta guy who owns it says, yeah, I don't want to sell? I said, the, I suppose the only thing I could say, I said, well, what, what was he doing that night? And he said, nothing particular. I said, well, why don't you and your wife come and have dinner with me at the hotel. He said, yes, he'd like to do that. Uh, it was a lovely starlight night, big moon, stars, under the palm trees, just what you'd expect a tropical night to be. It was about 11 o'clock at night when uh, it's called Philip, the owner, said to me, you're not such a bad guy. And I said, aren't I? <laughs> Thank you. And he said to me, no, I inherited the island from my godfather and I wouldn't want to sell it to anyone who wouldn't look after it. And he said, I, I have a feeling that you would uh, look, look, after, look after the island. So I said, does that mean that you, you might think of selling it to me? And he said, it could be. It was four minutes to midnight on the very last day of my holiday that I shook hands with the band and the island became mine. Brendan bought Moyen Island in 1962 and has been living on it for the past 34 years. In that time, he and his good friend Rene Lafortune planted every tree you see on the island, built every path you walk, and brought every giant tortoise you encounter.
The challenge is to cut a, to cut a, a, a manageable path yeah. round this island. Yeah. It's, it's quite a challenge, and for, particularly for somebody who doesn't know anything about it. I mean, let's face it, I came here, I didn't know anything about island life. I didn't know what. I do know that in a matter of weeks, I'd lost some stone in weight, two or three stones in weight. I went to see the doctor. I was so worried. I said, well, you know why? And he said, yes, you look like a man who's losing weight. And uh, <laughs> uh, he checked and he said, you know, you're very fit. Uh, if I were you, I would continue having your mangoes. I would continue eating your fish. I would continue working hard on the island and you'll be a fit, much fitter man than you were sitting behind your desk as an editor. He was right, of course. I was able, when I came here, to quite literally put everything behind me. All the things that I'd done uh, as, a, as an editor, all the things I'd done uh, in a, in a, a civilized society. Uh, okay, all, all these things I had done, and to be quite honest, I didn't need to do them again. So now I had a different challenge with my colleague, and I, uh, this I have not really mentioned enough, to be honest, uh, a guy called René La Fortune, who was a son of the fisherman who was a guardian of the island before I came here. He started to work with me when he was 19, and uh, what, what I didn't do, he did, or what he didn't do, I did, and so it worked very well. And uh, now there's only me, and it, it, is, it, is become, it becomes a little bit difficult. And in fact, it's the two of us who have, in fact, uh, cut the paths. He's often started from one end, and I started at the other, and we met in the middle. In many ways also, the, the island, uh, it, it, it rather tells you what it needs to be done next. And so you know, first of all, that you must put a path around the island so that you can see what the island looks like. And that was great fun because uh, I had no idea what I was going to find as we cut through the bush. And we found the site of the first house. We found two pirate graves. We found all sorts of things and uh, we realized that it was too much bush. In fact, we realized it was nearly all <laughs> bush. And uh, so we decided, well, better to start putting in some trees and making the island not only look good, but be useful. And uh, so we started, and today, right, 16,000 trees and and palms and shrubs are well established on the island. It looks a totally different island. So when you when you ask us, ask me what you know, how how did it how do we start to work? It it all sort of evolved of its own accord. Uh, it's just a question that we had to have a house to live in. We had to have paths to cut, and then the birds came, and then we had to have more trees, and then we realised how how beautiful. Uh, the island could be. Isn't it? Oh, 
In its flat underneath, it's a little girl. Oh. Has a small tail. And it's dome shaped. Oh. And this is the kindergarten. And then over there are the teenagers. But it is possibly the only place where you can come ashore and as you walk around the island, you bump into and meet uh, tortoises, giant tortoises, ambling along, happy and free, uh, living their lives, having their babies. Uh, this is something really very special. I, I mean, I don't, I don't say that uh, cutting a hillside, even though it might be a bit barren and rough, uh, to build a house is going to beautify the hillside. Uh, that's, that, uh, maybe it would be better to plant a few trees, but at least you have to have somewhere to live. And uh, so, okay, we, we realized, let's do it ourselves. And uh, over the years, one question been asked by time, why didn't you get people come and help you? Come and help us. We, 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 would, we would have to do work just as hard bringing them here and taking them back and looking after them, it is much, much better for us to, 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 do, to do the job. It's, it's fine to, to drop by just for a day uh, and see the beauty of the place, but then you've got to keep the place clean. You have 2,000 coconut trees, and uh, every month they drop at least two big palm fronds. Now, if you leave them lying around, the place will look a mess in no time at all. And this is only a, a minor job that nobody ever even thinks about. It's not for everyone. And uh, bear in mind, for example, had I been married, it would have been uh, a little bit difficult because the wife would have been wanting to shop around the corner. Uh, she, she would not have liked the idea of no electricity, no piped water. So many people come to the island, even, even today I have some people came to the island and they say, oh, it's wonderful, you have a wonderful, this is a wonderful life, it's like Eden, it's paradise, this is what we would like to do. Would they like to do it? I'm not so sure, because I look at them, they're in their very nice clothes and their dresses and the rest of it, and they're sitting and they're having their beers at the bar. Uh, they're used to a different way of life, just as I was used to a different way of life. Well, okay, I managed to change. When I lay in my bed in the house where we lived when I was a, a boy, it's coming back a bit, huh? um, and looked out through the window, there were some beautiful trees. And of course, uh, unlike in, 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 um, in Seychelles here, the trees lost all their leaves in winter time. And I used to lie back and I used to look at the trees and would make all sorts of stories out of them and think and pictures and faces of people and things like this. That, that's a millionaire's palm tree. That's the one that if they cut that down, it gives you the millionaire's salad. Oh, yeah? Mm. The millionaire's salad? It is also endemic. Oh, it's also uh, uh, endemic. Endemic? And that one is also endemic. That is uh, Bois Jolica. Hmm. Oh, and this one that's fallen down, I was eating some of that at lunchtime. <laughs> Cashew nut. Cashew nuts? Not, not, I wasn't actually eating, eating that, but I was eating. Huh. The, the island gradually taught you what to do. You, uh, you do understand? We, as, as you went along, you thought to do things, but then you looked at the island and you, you realized, no, no, this, this island is, 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 is an island and it knows itself what it wants to do. It know, and you know, because when you look at it, you realize, okay, we plant something here, it's not going to survive, because simply, uh, it's not the place for this particular sort of vegetation to grow. And uh, along these lines, for example, there was an area where we wanted to take out the bush, and uh, 
we, we realized that there was available mahoganies. And uh, we, we, we brought over uh, 50 just to see how they would go. And they loved the island. So the next year we brought over another 150. So that made it 200. These, these particular mahoganies, you can see on the island today, they're 60, 70 feet high. They're doing very well. And so we have actually planted 700 mahogany trees on the island. But you see, the first thing that people talk, say when you talk about or they see the mahogany is, oh, they make beautiful furniture. They, they, they see them as a source of, of, of wood for, oh, you name it, boats, housing, furniture, or anything. They don't see it as a tree. And this is, I see it as a tree. I don't want to cut it down. I didn't plant it to cut it down. I planted it because I wanted it to be there. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's all right. It's okay. It's all right. You know me now. You know me now. It's nice. It's nice. There's fish fish there. It's nice and good. Mmm. Yes, nice and good. Yes. Oh yes, broke his leg. Broke his leg, but now, now he's feeling a bit better. Okay, good little bit. Come on, put you down. Steady, 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 steady. Oh, we're going to be a big, big bird. Look at this big wig span. Look, oh, very big bird is going to be. Thing which, when you talked about dreams, there was one dream which used to come up, uh, and I've never forgotten it. And that was, if ever there was a steamroller, I, I, I'm talking, I'm talking about dreams, so it's not not all that stupid. If there ever there was a steamroller in in the dream, it was bad, 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 bad. I was to keep away from steamrollers because steamrollers meant the destruction of nature, all right? And in a way, if you want to come full circle, I would not want to see a steamroller on this island. Ecology and economics comes from the same root. They to do with our house, which is the natural environment. And basically, we have to marry the two, if the two have not been married already. And it's funny because it seems like there are these two forces, opposing forces, yes. you know, that are colliding right here on this island. Yes, they are. Uh, there's no doubt about it. If you, here, here we are in the heart of a marine national park. We're one of five islands in the Marine National Park. 
The other four islands have all got hotels or about to have hotels, some very big hotels on them. Environment is very important for the Seychelles because basically um, we live off the environment. Um, the whole economy is based on the environment. We earn our living from tourism and from fisheries and everything else, every other activity which brings in um, a revenue for the different households and livelihood is directly or intrinsically linked to the environment. So I've already been approached. People want to buy the island. And my fir first question is, what do you want it for? They don't say, oh, I want it because I want to come and live here. It's so beautiful and uh, I won't mind people coming and seeing the island. No, no, no. They say, oh, we want it because it's ideal for, like the other islands, build building a hotel. So what do you do in the, in, for future generations of young Seychelles? Well, what are they going to do? How much did they offer you for the island? There's a lot of money. More or less. Well, it was uh, something like 24 million pounds. Pounds. I said that Brendan, Dad, keep on doing, do not sell his island or the people will destroy the animal and destroy the environment. Well, don't let the friends take the island because it, uh, it, our, it is our heritage. So I. I would tell him to keep on doing the same work and advise his son or his daughter to do. The problem is he doesn't have any children. That's why the island is in danger. No, no wife. No wife and no children. So when Brendan dies, no one knows what is going to happen to the island. Give it to me. And many people want to take the island and build big hotels on it. Because you have to accept that there, there's, there's, got, there's got to be development. You, you see, you see, I'm, I'm not saying you can't have development. You, of course you have to have development. Uh, otherwise, the, the future generations won't be around. But you have, if, if you, you've got to balance it, you've got to be sensible about it. You've got to say, OK, we we, four of the islands have gone now, oh, let's keep this one. At least at the moment, I can say, yes, we keep it. Because that's what, that's what, what, what I want. But what will happen? When, 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 when I'm not here anymore, a coconut hits me on the head, something like this. Uh, okay, uh, so I've set up the Moyne Island Foundation. We've created a foundation, uh, which is a, a self-perpetuating foundation. The objects of the foundation are very simple. That it's got to live Mayan as is. Uh, yes, it can earn certain income. It needs income, but to maintain the island in its present state. Or the government here decides that in it, it's in its interest to, to build a hotel on it. Uh, but we will have to cross those bridges when we reach there. I think it's the foundation has very clear and definitive aims. More understanding between members of the foundation themselves as to what could happen negative, what could happen positive, and how to bring about the positive to make sure that what he would like to happen really happens rather than it being suddenly taken over for a hotel development or something, you know, which would, be, which would be a whole lifetime's work almost, kind of suddenly negated, which would be extraordinarily sad. So I, I just hope that we can push things in the right direction. But on many of the other islands, they've come up with a different kind of formula, an economic formula where the five-star hotel pays for the conservation of the island. What do you think about this formula that's being used here? Well, we think it's a good idea simply because we started that idea. BirdLife International started that with Frigate Island about 20 years ago. And Nature Seychelles then came and continued the work of, of uh, BirdLife International and we've been able to develop these private partnerships with hotels like Frigate Island, Cousin Island, which is the neighbor to Cousin, with Bird Island, with Dennis Island, where we have five-star resorts. 
And this is a formula that's working. It's working because other organizations have also adopted this kind of formula. So what do we do? We, we, just, we just write it off? We say, oh, forget what we did. And the, to the free roaming tortoises, oh, let them all be packed up and sent somewhere. The birds, oh, we don't need to feed those. Leave the 2,000 birds that we've encouraged to come here. And all these very nice endemic plants, trees, palms that are found only in Seychelles, nowhere else in the world, and we have most of them growing on this island. We let them be cut down so that the villas and things can be built. Of course you don't do this. If you, if you, have, any, if you have any real thought or any thinking of the future. I think uh, leadership is very, very important because without uh, the political will, uh, you cannot uh, have uh, uh, good environmental protection and sustainable development. And that political will must not only be nationally, but also uh, globally. And uh, in Seychelles, uh, for example, from the very beginning, when we achieved independence, we placed uh, environmental protection, environmental management at the forefront of all our uh, development. Hello, my name is Joel Morgan, and I'm the minister responsible for environment, natural resources, and transport. It's not about being rich. It's about what we've done for our country. It's about what we, what we have believed in and what we have invested in over so many years uh, for, for people who uh, 30 years ago were living in, in huts, uh, in, in, small, in small shacks, and are today enjoying a standard of living that perhaps is unmatched in the entire region. Uh, we have a lot of investment already in country, and we have a lot of investment that is planned uh, in the very near future, in the next two to three, four years. We have a number of islands in the marine park which could lend themselves well to um, tourism development. So why not allow that, but at the same time ensure that you have very, very strict uh, environmental uh, um, um, parameters and environmental guidelines that they operate under. Um, here we're talking eco-friendly. We're talking of, of things that basically would allow the economy to benefit. My name is Rolf Payet from the Seychelles. I'm the special advisor to the president. I think there is money to be made. There's more money to be made in this new era, era of a, a carbon-free society. A society which actually respects the environment, which can actually rehabilitate the environment. We've shown that in Seychelles. We've shown that in Seychelles that if you make an investment in tourism, you make a similar investment in conservation. You make a similar investment in rehabilitation. Your tourism product attracts more value, generates more revenue in the long term than would have just come in today using a traditional tourism model, uh, uh, break everything, cut everything down, modify the entire environment and present the tourists with a cosmetic, uh, cosmetic, cosmetic size tourism experience. Many of the, these islands are really out of the reach of the normal Seychellois or the normal citizen of the world. The point is that we are using the money of rich people to conserve biodiversity that could have been lost if that money had not been accessed. So I think that's the point we have to make. If there are people with money and they want to take this money and give it to the conservation, let's do it. It saddens me that we can sit here and wonder about the future of Mayem when it seems like there could only be one future for Mayem. Yeah and it's the one we're sitting in right now. And I just don't understand how there can even be an issue regarding that. Well, I'm, I'm, I think I've said, if you look around, if you, you have five islands, and four of them have got big hotels. The fifth island is sitting there, and the people who control things, no, I don't, I'm not being political or anything like this. But people who are interested and greedy. Yes, greed is a good word. Yes, it, it is greed. Uh, have another one. It's not, they use another word to, 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 they say development. 
they get away with a lot of a lot of bad things by using the word development. We must never forget that Seychelles were, po were po uh, populated only in 1770. Man came here, and as man is the greatest predator in the world and greatest destroyer, they tried to destroy a lot, but fortunately, we started become very conscious before the impact of tourism. Imagine you had an island. You owned it. And along came a rich, rich person and offered you 34 million euros for the island. Would you sell the island? No. 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 Why not? Because uh, they'll destroy. They lie to you. They say they're going to take care of it, but they don't. But if somehow the cost of running um, Mayan becomes prohibitive and you have to get loans or whatever, then I think the more rational members of the foundation will argue that we will have to cave into the economic pressure. But one thing I would like to add also is that in Seychelles we have uh, almost 50% of our land territory uh, as natural reserves. We have also national parks, we have uh, a number of uh, protected areas both, both in the sea and, and, and uh, on land. We spend a lot of money to manage and protect the environment. The pressure has been intense. And as you say, there's been a lot of international pressure uh, in relation to our current rate of development and our current standard of living of uh, our country. There's been pressure to devalue the currency. There's been all kinds of other economic pressures brought about by um, all the players in the international um, um, sectors. the responsibility of government to negotiate properly with the invest foreign investor and it's the responsibility of the investor also to be careful of the social people. You will not just come here and get money. You have to care for the local. We are the people of the land. You are just a foreign investor and it's good. But you have to think about us here. People will suffer here. Nowadays we don't have a lot of things because we don't have foreign currency. Most of the thing here we imported. What we want is a stronger partnership with the various actors in the economy. And our fear is that some of the st very strong actors that are coming in are foreign companies based elsewhere with which we don't have strong links and who may be very large multinationals for which Seychelles is only a very small part of their business. That is the fear that we have. If you build a lot of five star, it's not, it's not worth for the local. It's benefit only the foreign investor. Because most of their money are not living here in the max. They are pulling out their money. It's been a test of strength and a test of determination when it comes to can we maintain and can we continue to to have the Seychelles that we have always known. 
there's been tremendous pressure uh, on us to change things. For example, to, to liberalize rapidly. Slowly, slowly, the rights and privileges of the social world will be encroached upon. And as you know, in every country in the world, money works, unfortunately. But there are ways of developing without having to, to damage the environment. Seychelles is one case in point, and I think there are others that can do that. So if we have such models, if there's enough people of goodwill and people are aware of the issues, people start engaging themselves in, in making the, the necessary changes in their lifestyle, then we, we will eventually get there. I'm personally optimistic. I mean, it's a question of whether you believe in it or you don't. I, I console myself that um, when you have something like tourism, it's cyclical, you know? The cycle seems to be, you have somewhere totally unknown, then somebody knows about it and they open it, and then only the very wealthy can get to it, and then they move on somewhere else, then it becomes more sort of down market, then you get masterism, and then it's destroyed and they move on. Somehow in Seychelles, this cycle hasn't quite happened yet. It's been dragging on and on. But the signs are that we will make the same mistakes. As you know, I, I'm, 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 I've created the Moyen Island Foundation and I want it, the island to stay as it is. I don't want to see it being turned into a five-star hotel, no way. A man doesn't spend 30, 34 years of his life so far creating, trying to create something a little bit special, something that's natural, like, a, in fact, creating a nature reserve uh, uh, and want it to just be checked away and we made a, a retreat for some wealthy people to come here and uh, have a nice holiday and go away and then go to the Caribbean or go somewhere else and the rest of it. No, if you, I say, over here is a five-star hotel, over there is one, on there, there's a new one being built here. We're surrounded by, by, by people who are wanting to build hotels, people who want to make money because that's all really what all they want to do. Uh, I understand the need for development, but at the same time, there has to be some sense in it. And the sense in here is that goodness enough. Hotel, 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 hotel. This is the only one with nothing here. Oh, for goodness sake, let it be. I, I don't want to see, I would not like to see myself being <laughs> buried on the island and uh, being viewed only by wealthy tourists. <laughs> Here I am with all those gadgets and with the product of all that development asking whether we should cut down. Or I guess I'd be the first that would have to cut down. So there's a certain degree of hypocrisy. Just like I think there's a certain degree of hypocrisy of us as representatives of the West coming down to a developing nation like the Seychelles. And you know, feeling that we have any right to even ask them to develop in a very specific way. You're, you're, not, you're not telling the, the, the Seychelles they, 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 they mustn't do this and they mustn't do that. All, you, all, all you're suggesting is uh, they, they should come to realize that they have some very wonderful things in Seychelles uh, and they, they must maintain them and, and not lose them. If you were to talk about what's really important, why are people paying so much money to come here to see our way of life? And we're trying so hard to become like they are. 
rat race, you want uh, more material things. And it's so, the, the, the irony, I find really sad. You know? What we see in big cities consumes the varieties being, having um, all sort of stuff thrown at you, you know, from the TV, from the newspaper, from everywhere you look. Um, you go into the supermarket, there's 110 different items on the shelves and you've got a problem to, to choose what you need to consume. But on a small island, if you go to a shop, then you know exactly what you need because there's so few on there, you know, and you just grab it. You don't even think about it. I've been living on the island for 34 years. I could, coming back to the island and with the prices increasing as they, as, as they, ha as they have, that the island is worth several million, a million pounds, uh, I could say, well, what's the point of my cutting bush and doing all the jobs I do day after day? Uh, sell the island, there's plenty of people want to buy it to build, build a hotel, and then I've got, so, I've got enough money to live the life of Riley, as they say, live a wonderful life, uh, cruise around the world. I like, going, I like cruise ships, but cru go cruise around the world and, and, and spend a wonderful time seeing the world and enjoying myself. Although people think that this is the perception of happiness, it's, it's not. It's, it's really the, the simplicity of living on an island, which is, which is the quality of life. And the quality of life, the high quality of life, is your happiness, really. I can do it if I, if I sold the island. But, 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 I don't want to. I'm, I'm, I'm happier to get my hands dirty. I'm happier to not be greedy for a, a, a wonderful life. I'm ha because I enjoy what I do. I enjoy being with nature and also I also appreciate the fact that what I'm doing is useful. And I think living on a small island, you realize how close human beings are to the environment. But you also realize, I think, uh, how dangerous it is if the environment turns against you. And this is what we are seeing on many, many small islands around the world. I like the concept of the miners and Aries. You know, in the old days, when the miners went 
digging for coal or whatever in mines, poisonous gas was a big problem. And they used to take a cage with a canary in there. And they would know that something was up wrong if the canary stopped singing. And I think islands are a little bit like that. You know? Because they are smaller, things happen faster. And so it's a little bit like an alarm system. What happens in Ireland will sooner or later happen elsewhere. It's, it's, it's difficult. It's not a one-man band, is it? I mean, what I would like to, to do, yes, I, I, would like, I would like some very firm action to be taken uh, along many lines uh, to, to stop, stop the pollution. I mean, that's the most urgent thing at the moment, to stop, stop the pollution, to really go, go to town on it. But uh, it, it's, it's, it's need, it needs more than one man on an island. It, uh, one man can do things on an island, yes, because it's, it's, he's got the say, and, and also it's, it's very small. And he can actually physically do it. And I wish to emphasize here, yeah, poverty is very much linked to the environment. If you don't solve uh, the politicians, you don't solve poverty, you won't be able to solve the environmental problem. And on the other hand as well, among, among the developed countries, if you don't solve the consumerism, you don't solve the awareness issue, you won't be able to solve and address the environmental issues, you see? So there are all these links, inherent links, with, with the way politics is run at the global level. But I think the world, the rich world, the industrial world, is not doing enough. Look at little Seychelles. Little Seychelles with, little, with uh, limited resources, we spend so much to try to preserve the environment, the environment and retain the Seychelles as one of the last paradise uh, spots on, on, on Earth. Not only for us, but for people of the world to come and, and enjoy it and live it because they have destroyed their parts in other, in other parts of the world. But then they should help us to, to sustain it, to develop it and to, and to maintain that last piece of paradise that we still have on Earth. But as you know, money is spent in different ways, uh, destroying, destruction, killings and so on, wars. And uh, I think there should be more a global conscience. Brennan, you have a great relationship with your instinct. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you a difficult question because the yeah, answer... all difficult. No, this one is difficult all right. for what it implies. Yes, OK. What do you really think is going to happen to Anya? Oh dear, yes, that, 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 is, that, that is difficult. Um, I don't know. Um, I know what I would like, I already said. I would like to see Moyen continue to be a welcome, welcoming place uh, for young, future young Seishawa, for visitors from all over the world. That's, that's what I would like to see. Uh, but I, I'm not foolish. Uh, and to say, well, everybody's going to be in agreement with my ideas. Obviously, the trend and the feeling is development. And uh, development means money. And people like money. And I'm afraid there are more people who like the idea of having more money than having a place like Moyen preserved for future generations. Two minutes to go. <laughs> well, Bren, I think I'm going to hit you with a big question. That's the first question. Well. I know it's a difficult one to respond to because it's, it's, I guess it's kind of vague. But uh, I really like to hear it from you because I'm sure you've had a lot of time to think about this. So, uh, who is Brendan Grimshaw? Who, me? Yeah. Uh, just a guy. Uh, a very ordinary guy. A guy who people say, ooh, you own an island. He's the guy who says, no, I don't own an, own an island. Tomorrow, coconut falls down, knocks me on the head. I don't own an island. I say, I'm like the Guardian, I look after it. God owns it, I look after it. And I'm just a guy. I'm just a Guardian. In this set, 
I used to be a newspaper editor. Then I was a newspaper editor. I was a schoolboy once, a long, long time ago, yes. But I ran away from school. I didn't like that when I was 15, okay? So I was a schoolboy and I was a soldier. I was a soldier for three years. It didn't make me a soldier. So what sort of guy am I? I'm a very ordinary guy. I'm the sort of guy I hope you would like to meet. This journey began with a question. What kind of world is this that would destroy the work of men like Brendan Grimshaw and Rene Lafortune? I don't know that I've provided the answer. But what seems clear to me is that we've created a monster that assigns an economic value, a number, to trees, islands, and even people. The natural resources and heritage of some have become the commodities and wealth of others. But we as individuals are both part of the problem and the solution. And the work of a few can become the inspiration of many. Mwayan Island was declared a national park in 2008, thanks to those of us who came together and believed that it does matter, that we can make a difference, and that everything is not simply a number. Après qu'il y ait statut et une réserve spéciale, le gouvernement à présent déclare Île Moyenne comme un parc national. We hadn't done it with any intention of setting up a, a national park. We hadn't done it with any any a aim of saying, oh, we must do this, we must do that. No, no, we, it, was just, it was just a natural course of events. Thank you for what we signed a little while ago. And I do, do from, the, from my heart, say you're doing a wonderful thing. Minister Morgan, he profits on occasion to salute his efforts and the gas money activity, the organization civil and sector private, for the contribution important to the conservation of the CSEVA.